trees. Trees of the Bible. You know, it's an interesting and fascinating study when you get into s symbology. The symbolism that our Father used many times to make a lesson very clear that would be very difficult to put in words were we not to use an analogy of something that is natural. And if you understand nature, it makes it real easy then to fall in line. One of the first parables put forth in the Word of God was by one of Gideon's sons. And the plot, if I may uh, bring you, set the stage, so to speak, is that out of about 70 sons, there was a little difficulty as to who would succeed and become the ruling monarch or judge. And quite frankly, a son by, I'm going to say a strange wife, killed all but one, and the only reason he didn't kill that other one, other than himself, was that he hid himself. And, the, and he was a true son of the house uh, of Israel. And within this, then, we have a parable given by Almighty God concerning a fake king or a wrongly appointed king, a king appointed by the people, so to speak, for they wanted the bad king. And the word coming forth from our Father as to the authority and the fact that only God himself and appoint a true leader, whether it be a, a gifted um, evangelist, a gifted teacher, or whatever the case may be. So we see within that, then, an analogy used by Jotham against Abimelech, an analogy using trees. And it says a great deal more because it, it is, it's applicable to even you today. Judges chapter 9, let's pick it up with verse 7. And when they told it to Jophan, that is, that all of his brothers were killed, murdered, he went and stood at the top of Mount Gerizim and lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem that God may hearken unto you. Uh, Shechemet um, Maid was the father of Abimelech, a mother, rather, of Abimelech. And here comes the parable. Listen to it. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And in the manuscripts it says all the trees went forth to appoint a king being all-inclusive or applying to the fact that in the um, analogy it applies to everyone, and indeed it does, as far as appointing a king over you. And every Christian knows definitely that we have only one king of kings and lord of lords. It is not up for grab. It is not up for man to decide. But you see that God is left out of this inasmuch as the trees... Let, let, the, let the tree symbolize people, if you like. That's what it does. They wanted to point their own king. Not from God, all right? The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them, and they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. In other words, we trees, or we people, choose thee as king. Reign over us. Nine. But the olive tree said unto them, should I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honor God? Yes, both honor God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? Do you think I want to be king over the trees and leave my fatness that God has appointed me this place to put my roots into the earth and produce fruit? Don't overlook that. You might say, well, it isn't in the script. No, that's what it means. Produce fruit for both God and man. In other words, there's another way to look at that. is serving its purpose. Let's add a little to that. Serving its God-given purpose. Anytime you fail to serve your God-given purpose, you're out of step with everything. You might say, well, how is it I'm out of step with everything? Because you're out of step with God. 
And when you're out of step with him, he's going to see that everything messes up in your little old life. He's going to turn your little old life topsy-turvy. And you're going, to, you're going to learn some lessons the hard way. But the olive tree was too intelligent for that. The very oil that we anoint for healing, that we anoint our homes if we have problems in them, place a barrier there by this same fruit through the power of Yahshua that nothing passes that mark. And if you have faith to believe that, then it is de facto. It shall not. But there can be no doubt. So the olive tree simply said, No, I won't do it. Tim. And the tree said to the fig tree, Come thou, now be a good old boy, come thou and reign over us. Be our king. Eleven. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit? Should I cease yielding fruit? And go to be promoted over the trees? Question. Of course not. That sweetness, the fig cake, the fig cake that was even used in another, uh, not parable, but an actual event to pull a boil from a person's body and give him 15 years more life. The fig cakes, uh, which were dried and carried on long trips and sustained strength uh, and yes, the fig tree that would even have a good part and a bad part, even as people have good parts and bad parts to their uh, sides, to their personalities, their lives, their traits, and so forth. Twelve, and then said the trees into the vine, this would be the grapevine, come thou and reign over us. Thirteen, and the vine said unto them, should I leave my wine? which cheereth God, yes, you heard it right, it cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees. I want you to think in the analogy what you've got to equate to this is the fact that would you, for a man-appointed authority, power, position, separate yourself from the natural order of things, that is to say the place and gifts God has given you? Would you? Think about it. Let me ask it a different way. Would you trade your place in the kingdom, that is to say, producing fruit for that that you were created for, being a blessing to God, for authority and power appointed by man, some government, some system? Would you like to feel really important for man? That's what the trees are telling you. They wanted no part of it. They were created to keep their roots in the soil and to perform the bearing of the fruit that they were so designed for and fruit they would produce. That was paramount rather than being the high muckety duck of all trees. The analogy is a good one. The parable is a good one. Then said all the trees unto the bramble, Come thou and reign over us. Now the bramble is a good example of that that should reign. What is it? First of all, so that you, uh, if you do not understand what a bramble is, let me explain. Thorns. What is its fruit? What does it produce? Thorns. What are they good for? To stick you to bring you pain, to bring your animals pain. They are good for nothing perhaps other than a hedge to keep men in their own place. And that is questionable. If um, Perhaps if it were not for all that is symbolized by the thorn, you wouldn't need a hedge in the first place. It is the bramble or the thorn that if the seed in the parable of the sower were to fall among, the devil came and stole, choked the life out of them, stole them away. So the thorn is basically the bramble always connected with Satan. So you see the forming of the false king. <clears throat> now listen carefully. And the bramble said unto the trees, If in truth... Well, now we're going to get down to a vow here, all right? 
If in truth ye anoint me king over you, all of you, then come and put your trust. Whoa, my friend, when someone tells you, put your trust in me, and it's someone other than God, if it be someone other than the Holy Spirit, you better let your little old ears snap right up to attention. You better go on the point, and you better understand what it is you're getting yourself involved with. If you anoint me king over all of you and put your trust in my shadow, and if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. The cedars of Lebanon have always been symbolic of our peoples, the people of God. Now, you're all intelligent beings. What was it he wanted you to put your trust in? The comfort of his shadow. There's just one problem, friend. A bramble, or the fruit of the bramble being only thorns, no leaves, has no shadow. Has no protection. The fruit of it is to stick you, to pain you, to hurt you. Good for nothing. And yet in relationship to the same bramble, when the King of kings and Lord of lords came in his first advent, what would be his first crown? The first crown that would be placed upon his forehead to prick him and bring forth the first trickle of blood that was shed for you. It would be by none other than a crown of thorns, a crown of the bramble. God's Word is so complete and so perfect. His analogy is so simple. And that was as near as the bramble or the thorn shall ever come to being a crown, a true crown or a king over anything. For the very blood that the thorn shed was shed for you, for me, for our sins, for our shortcomings, for our inadequacies. What should we learn from this? Be very careful when someone says, Trust me. Trust me. Come into my shadow. When a wise person knows a bramble doesn't even cast a shadow. Can be no comfort whatsoever that you've been lied to. And then you can better understand the parable of the sower, the seeds that fall among the bramble, the thorn, is gone already. Choked out. The false crown that shall be worn in a spiritual sense or equation by Satan himself. So God uses trees in this analogy. God brings forth wisdom in the simplest way. It's there for the taking. Let's go back to another place that trees are used, if we may. Let's go back to Genesis, the third chapter. I need not read this to you, for you're all very familiar with it. Trees used symboli symbolically of people. And you'll remember in the third verse, the woman's answer to Satan, the old chief bramble, we might tag him, the head tear. And I'm not indicating that tares are bramble. They are not. But yet... Their fruit is, is like uh, almost the same in the sense as comfort is concerned. Third verse in Genesis, but the fruit, fruit is important. That's why Christ said, if you're not intelligent enough to figure the word out, test the fruit of the man. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. It was a promise, and that promise came to pass. They touched it, and they died. In that same day, bearing in mind that a day with the, our Father is 1,000 years, they did not live to that age. They died. 
And since that time, all mankind has died. Short of that age, even including Methuselah, that's why he could not live past uh, the point he reached. What is that tree? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You're not to partake of that tree. Was it an actual tree? Of course it wasn't. It was an innocent. It was a man, and his name is Satan, that old devil, the dragon, head of the bramble bush, king that wants to be king of kings. Then let's go to the close of, uh, if we may, that third chapter, which would take us, let's take it with verse 22. And the Lord said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove um, out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. It is so important that we understand our Father's overall plan. So very important. So we have a question. Who then, pray tell me, is this tree of life if we know that the tree of the knowledge and good and evil is Satan. Who is this tree of life and why would God place angelic beings with flaming swords to prevent man from partaking of it? The answer, of course, is one you all know, Christ. Why wouldn't God want Christ to partake? For a very simple reason, because of the world it was. Every soul that came short in the world that was must have the opportunity that you have today. And you're a late comer. Every soul had to have the opportunity to be born to woman, to come into this world age. And that tree of life was protected and controlled by the living God until the time that that tree of life would wear that crown of thorns and that he would come to that cross. Yes, even wearing that crown of thorns to pay a price. Do you not remember the time that Jesus was walking up the hill to Golgotha to be crucified? Luke chapter 18, I think it's about verse 10 through 13, something like that. And the women were crying along the side of the road, weeping bitterly. As he carried this tree up that mountain, known as the cross, and he looked and he said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me. But rather weep for yourselves, for the day shall come when it shall be said, Blessed, blessed, yes, blessed are those that are barren, whose paps have never gave suck, meaning those that had not fallen off to the bramble bush, to the false tree. Bear in mind what he's carrying as these words come forth, the tree. And he said, if they do this to the green tree, whatever shall they do to the dry? Meaning the spirit. For the tree was yet green in the sap, ran in the vein. But even at that time, being alleviated by the crown of thorns, the beginning of the shedding of that blood, as he climbed that hill, go 
brother, the skull in another language, ours, to be crucified for you, for your children, for your parents even to this time. The tree of life. Had the cherubims removed, um, the guards taken away, and was given to with man to do whatsoever he wished. And it was obvious what man did to that tree. Yes, even the green tree. I feel led to turn to Hosea chapter 14. In the Minor Prophets. We'll start with verse 4. I need not explain this to you, for you know that it pertains to the tenth tribe of Israel that went north, and he told Hosea, which means Savior, to go marry a whore. And it was, this, it was an analogy within itself as to how God would reclaim his people. And in the closing chapters of his people, Lo Ami Ami, we find these words written. Verse 4, chapter 14, Hosea. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. We find these words written. Verse 4, chapter 14, Hosea. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him, meaning his son. The ten Ephraim, symbolic of the ten tribes. I will be as the dew upon Israel. He shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. That's what Lebanon. Again, you've got trees, flowers, nature. Symbology whereby you can better understand Lebanon, the cedars of Lebanon, always being symbolic of the people. His branches shall spread and his beauty shall be as the olive tree and his smell as Lebanon, all that beautiful, sweet, Fragrance of cedar. Cedar, when milled, even turned into foot chests or closets or ward places for wardrobe that the moth never, never enters, nor the canker worm to take away. All preserving that the locusts can never bother. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. Do you want to know something that gives a shadow? An evergreen. Not as the bramble, not as the thorn that can give you no protection whatsoever and is dead in appearance even in the winter time, but the evergreen, always bearing, ever bearing of the shade, though it may be skimpy to some people's taste, it's always there. That shadow shall return, they shall revive as the corn. And grow as the vine, the scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, What have I to do any more with idols? Don't bring your false religions. Don't bring the bramble bush. Don't bring the king of thorns. Don't talk about the Antichrist. I want the real thing, is what he's saying. And I have heard him and observed him. And then, I am like a green fir tree. From me is thy fruit found. There is no other place that you find fruit that is produced year-round as the shade of the evergreen. As our Father himself describes himself as that evergreen. And is it not ironic, even at Yuletide, that time that they take the tree and they bring it in, how many really know what that it truly symbolizes? The fact that however many lights you place upon it, it still casts a shadow. That the needles, as long as the roots in the ground bear fruit year-round, meaning never die. It means you can put your trust in Him. 
and in Him, His Word, you can take the fruit. In Him, you have that peace of mind when you allow yourself to stop a moment and smell the cedars of Lebanon. Inhale His Word, absorb it, meditate upon it, and find that peace of mind in His assurance, His comfort, the simplicity of His teaching, that you can have joy. We have people in this nation that gain a little knowledge and they become dangerous to themselves and all around them. That inasmuch as if a person were to take the same tree and deck it with other things and worship it, you see, that's where the difference comes in as to whether you're worshiping something or not. I think most Christians worship God, not the tree. But it's important that your children know what the tree symbolizes, what the bramble symbolizes, what the olive symbolizes, what the fig symbolizes, what the vine symbolizes. And within that they have God in the symbology of the fur. It's so easy to explain to children when you use the wisdom in which God used himself that we as adults and mature Christians could carry forth the story of the trees. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6. We are talking about here in this chapter 6 about those that need maturity those that call themselves teachers and have need of a teacher themselves. For it would seem in verse 2 of chapter 6 in the book of Hebrews, all they can teach is salvation and baptism without going into the bramble, the fir, the olive, the depth, the bridge work that gives you strength and lets you pass over any stream without ever getting your feet wet. I speak of the bridge work of the Word of God. Verse 4 of chapter 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world come. Let me alleviate any anxiety of anyone that might get nervous about this. There are very few people that have ever tasted that power. Many people hold themselves accountable and they're not accountable for beans because they don't know beans. They have about as much skill and art in the Word of God as a chicken scratching around in the dirt. A little here, a little there. Cluck, cluck. And that's it. Stupidity! That's what Paul is talking about. Get maturity. As a matter of fact, in verse 1 of this chapter 6, the word perfection means come to full age, grow up. Six, if they fall, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open chain. You've heard me teach it many times. If you ever teach salvation to a room full of people that every soul in it has already been saved by accepting Yeshua, by accepting Jesus, it's blasphemy. It's like re-crucifying Him because He's the one that does the saving and it's like you saying it's not man that is in inadequate but Christ that is inadequate. Once He saved you, it's done. After that, it is on your part to bring and come to repentance. Salvation needs no renewing other than repentance. Christ is not the sinner. We are. Verse 7. For the earth which drinketh in the rain, we're going into an analogy now of nature. Do you know the earth and you know how it drinks in the rain? And do you know how the earth looks a few weeks later? Let's say if it's spring. It's dry, it's dead, but a nice rain comes. The earth seeks, uh, soaks it in, 
and nourishes uh, the vegetation, look at the difference, the change that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed. That is to say, God produces the very fruit of the crops the farmer tills, receiveth blessings from God. Do you understand what God is saying here? If you have already a room full of fruit picked, that's what salvation is, is. It's fruit gathered into the warehouse. Don't go out and try to pick it all over again. It's time for it, quite the contrary, to begin producing fruit. Do you understand how some people play church? I cannot give you a better analogy than our Father has in that very verse. Eight, but that which beareth thorns, uh-oh, sharpen up, and briars is rejected. That's why the bramble cannot reign as king. That's why inner Christ will never get his ship off the ground and is nigh unto cursing. A lot of people wonder why righteous indignation boils up in a teacher when he hears ignorance espoused by some, so many, because it's cursing, and it's cursing the Father you love. And you can grin and smile and go along with it in ignorance yourself if you're ignorant, but uh, let those that be men and women of God act as adults whose end is to be burned. Causes which comes from a, br a prime that means to be consumed. I can never give you a better illustration by your father of what's going to happen to the souls of those that follow the thorn. They're not going to be. They are going to be totally, completely consumed. Blotted out of the book of life as though they never existed from the first world age to the last gone, burned as the thorn. How many times have you heard it written before, before the meat in the kettle can feel the thorn? Why would it say the meat in the kettle feel the thorn? Because thorns are always used for fire in that area, because they burn so easy. That's all they're fit for is burning the bramble, the falseness. Trust in my shadow. Open your eyes. There's no shadow there in false teachings. There's no fruit there. Jesus Christ, as he climbed that hill, Golgotha, as he spoke to the daughters, thinking of them, remembering them, Weep not for me. He was carrying a symbol called a cross. He carried it himself most of the way, at least a large part of the way. And the very moment as it was laid upon the ground and he was spread upon it, and you could hear that hammer ring in the night as the nails were driven. And it was raised into place and kapfoof. You heard it fall into that shaft that held it erect. My dear friends, the cross became the tree of life. Symbolically speaking, at that instant, For the blood shed upon it, as the spear rather than the thorn alleviated the life spring, and as it is written in Deuteronomy 21, 22, 4, if a man be cursed and do a thing that is unworthy, then let him hang him in the tree. There was no sin or no curse in him. Only ours, only yours today, and that that you will commit tomorrow. 
And that cross, that tree, that Roman cross, becomes for the moment your tree of life. For there is no other way to have eternal life through the, other than through that tree of life. This is not a new teaching. It's a teaching of old. If you go into some of the caves of the second century that Christians hid, you see the cross referred to as the tree of life. It just happens to be those things that slip away from mature Christians as they stumble around in the bramble, as they seek and never quite find, as they see but never quite make out. Do you remember the time that Jesus touched the man and said, Do you see? And he said, I see trees moving as men. That's the lesson Jesus wanted you to know. These trees are men. These trees are you. These trees are our Father. And if you understand anything about horticulture, you can surely have a mature outlook at our Father's Word. Inasmuch as the cross is the tree of life for Christians, it symbolizes the tree of, tree of life for Christians today, for there is no other life other than through that cross. The very wood uh, that was hewn on that Roman cross. Many might say, well, it was a stake. No, it wasn't. Don't be silly. The Romans executed him he was executed on a Roman cross, which is very accurate the way it is described on the little crosses that Christians wear. It's just plain old common sense. It would have taken a special order from Caesar for him to be placed on a stake, and nobody would have dared, especially not a Roman soldier. That cross, that wood, and my dear friends, it was dry wood. So we went at that moment when he said, It is finished to the dry wood. And it became your tree of life for the moment. Is that a pretty picture? Well, it's a blessed picture. For you could not have done it, nor could I. He could. But within this teaching... When you understand the bramble and when you understand the thorn, and when you understand the fact that the subject was the placement of a true king, do not fall off to the false king after the price is paid on the tree of life, the cross. Don't let Satan tempt you. Mature in his word. Don't be wishy-washy this way five minutes and some other way another five minutes. What would you have done had he been wishy-washy about going on the cross? Which was your tree of life. Now else we despair. Let us go to what tomorrow brings. In closing, Revelation chapter 22. Verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. Beloved, you're not looking at a shadow here of things to come. You're not looking at symbology. You're looking at the real thing. Clear as Christian proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, and in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits. You see, beloved, that's the secret. Either produce fruit or burn. You got it? Think about it. Produce fruit or burn. And yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. We were all healed by that cross. Our souls were healed and conditioned for eternal life. A servant 
to the living God. And there is that time coming when the cross will no longer be symbolic of, uh, in the future sense, it still is now. Because let's look at it just one moment. Why was the tree of life placed with the angels guarding it in the garden? Because it was not time for the penalty to be paid. With the angels protecting that tree, and I want you to remember the words of our Savior when they were all concerned and worried, and he said, Hey, don't you know that I could ask and a whole army of angels would come and protect me, the tree of life? He did not want their protection at this time. It was time. The price was paid, and in Revelation 21, the brambles are burned. And in 22, we are with him in the eternal life that the cross purchased in the shelter and in the strength of the fruit from the tree. What have we learned? Beware when someone says, Trust me, I will be your king, for you already have a king. Trust me and come into my shadow and you see no shadow. Are they silver-tongued enough that you would still believe there was a shadow there when it doesn't exist? Look and judge. Well, that all sounds a little complicated. Well, let me simplify it for those that might have trouble with it. When you walk up to an apple tree and it has five or six oranges on it, friend, something's wrong. I mean, you know, get the old gray matter going and say, something is wrong. But you know why? You can tell by the fruit that it's not kosher. All right, I think I'll quit with that word. It's just not kosher. All right, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the living word. We thank you for the tree of life by the way of the cross. Oh, Father, that day, that that one that was conceived by the Holy Spirit in this season, that he was laid down upon that cross, and it was raised into position the tree of life the tree through which we find that eternal life. We thank you so much, Father. Thank you for forgiving our sins. Thank you for taking us back, as we covered in the book of Hosea, chapter 14. Thank you for your forgiveness upon our repentance. We'll be careful to give you the praise for it. In the name of Yeshua, Messiah, Jesus. Amen.